good morning and welcome to our Sunday worship uh, here at South Barrow Team Ministry. Today is Trinity Sunday and we're going to be thinking about God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit and how he calls us to live and work with him to rebuild the world. Really exciting stuff. My name's Carl, I'm the priest in charge of the South Barrow Team Ministry, which basically means I'm Vicar of St George's and St Aidan's, which is where we are this morning. Last week we had a competition, how many times did I say Pentecost? In case you were playing, it was nine. Your prize is the satisfaction of knowing you got it right. We're going to begin our worship this morning by singing a great uh, Trinity hymn which praises God just for who he is. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, which word and art and evermore shall be. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sin. So our Bible reading this morning uh, for Trinity Sunday is Jesus talking to his followers for the last time before he went back into heaven to be with his heavenly father. So he's giving them the last set of instructions, these really important words from Jesus. So I'm reading from Matthew's gospel, the first of the four gospels, and I'm right in the last chapter, chapter 28, and reading from verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, though some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and commanding them to obey everything that I have told you, and know that I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Well, that's a reading from Matthew's Gospel. And we talk about the Gospels, don't we? These four uh, accounts, these four almost like life stories of Jesus. And uh, Matthew, that we just heard from, he begins his story uh, going back to the very familiar Christmas story and um, uh, Mary and uh, the birth of Jesus, the circumstances. Mark doesn't go quite back that far. 
When you go to Luke's gospel, he says, well, I can top that. I can go further back than that. And uh, he goes back to John the Baptist and his birth and the relationship between Mary and Elizabeth. And then you go to John's gospel and he says, well, I can top you all. I'm going to go right back to the very beginning, beginning, beginning. And he goes back to creation. Can't go any further back than that. But there's another way of looking at it. What is the beginning of the gospel? Where does it start? What's the very first thing that people said that they said, this is the gospel? In other words, this is what Jesus is all about. This is the good news of Jesus. What was the first thing they said? Well, I think it was just three words. Jesus is risen. That's what they would have said. Or they probably wouldn't have said it quite like that. They'd have gone, Jesus is risen. You know, it would have been incredible news. They would have said it with gasps and wows and kind of, this is amazing. So then, okay, if if Jesus is risen is really the beginning of the gospel and really the heart of the gospel, and it is the heart of the gospel, then what's the next thing? What's the next most important thing? Well, I think it's right here. I think it's basically what we've just read. Now, this bit at the end of Matthew, where Jesus gives his disciples their last set of instructions, their marching orders, we sometimes call the great commission. The commission is just instructions that someone is given. Go and do this. And what Jesus says to them is what he's saying to all his followers. It's not just for the 12 that he was speaking to. It's for his church which means everyone who has decided to say I belong to Jesus and I'm following him all of all of us all of those people together are the church that's what the church means so these are Jesus founder of the church giving his marching orders if you like to the church so what does he say well he says go and make disciples baptize them and teach them now it can be quite tempting to kind of fix on those oh you know go and make disciples okay we can think of a program to do that okay and and then then we want to baptize them that's really important and it is really important and then we want to teach them now those are all really good things really important things that we want to be involved in and as a church we do all of those those things making disciples just means that we help other people to grow closer to God to learn how to learn together how to live our lives more the way God planned for us the the way that human beings really flourish and then baptism is a sign that somebody has decided to follow Jesus and we do that in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit so somebody is saying I want to be part of the life of God that's how I want to live and then we teach we learn together from God's word uh, how uh, to to find out more about God and how to live our lives in a way that's pleasing to God and, and good for us so we do all of those things Three good verbs there, make, baptize, teach, but they're not the most important. There's another little word in there, and it's the word go. It's that verb, go, go, go. It's the most important verb, probably the most important word in all of those verses. Because what Jesus is saying is, As the church, as the people of God, where you get your identity from, it's not when you're all kind of huddled together doing your own plans and doing your own things. The church, the people of God, we get our identity when we go out there. When we go where people are carrying the good news of Jesus, that's where we get our identity from. That's what it means to be church. We are the people who go in the name of Jesus. That is what we are for. Now, it's interesting to talk about identity, isn't it, just at the moment, because a lot of us are thinking, what does the future hold? What's it going to be like to be church when the lockdown is lifted, when we can all gather in amazing buildings like this? What's that going to mean? What, what, what does, how do we use the buildings now? Is that going to have to be different? It almost certainly is, but we don't quite know how yet what sort of changes are going to have to happen to the way that we worship and the way that we gather and the way that we meet people in the community how is all that going to change and while we're thinking about identity it's really helpful for us to 
grasp hold of the fact that our identity doesn't come from keeping ourselves busy just doing programs. Our identity comes from that word go. We are sent people. That's what defines us. We are the people who go with the message of Jesus and we meet people and we we come into contact with people out there in the world and we share the, the world that we're a part of and we share the good news that Jesus is risen, that first gospel, Christ is risen. So the go is about the where do we experience God and the where we experience God is in our contact with the world, sharing the good news of Jesus. And if we, at the church, people who follow Jesus, if we're really yearning for an identity, and I think we are at the moment, we're trying to figure out who we are. If we're really longing to find out where we need to get that identity from, the answer is in that word, go. That is our identity. We've talked a lot uh, in recent months, all sorts of people have, about a new reality, a changed reality. What's the future going to look like? And it is full of loss because there are some things that just won't be the same. We're not really going back to the way things were. The only direction that we can move in is forward into the way that things will be. And some things will be different. And that's going to be hard for all of us, isn't it? And there are going to be some losses and things for us to grieve over and be sad about and remember together. That's important. But as much as the future is full of loss, it's also full of opportunities too, full of things that we can grasp uh, in a new way. And if we're going to discover our identity as a church, it is going to be in that moving outward. So some of it will happen in these buildings and these buildings are going to carry on being really, really important. But so is the way that we together move outside of the building and come into contact with people beyond these walls. That's really going to matter as well. So what does that mean? I just want to set out uh, one or two things that I think we're really going to have to think about together uh, as we move forward into this. And the first one is about prayer. Now, I have a sense, a very strong sense, that over the next few months really right until the end of the year and and through and beyond we're going to have to do a lot of praying which is a great privilege it's also sometimes quite a hard thing for us to get go get hold of but I think if we're going to move together confidently into the future that God's got for us we've got to do that with our ears not only out to the community around us but really listening to God, listening to the Spirit, praying together, praying with God's word open in our hands. We've got to be praying. So, forewarning, I'm going to be a bit of a bore about prayer over the next few months, but I really do think it's important, and I would love us together to think about how we can grasp hold of prayer as a, as a, as a group, as a community, as church together. It's really powerful when we pray on our own. It's really powerful when we shoot those arrow prayers when things happen. But there's also something powerful that happens when we pray together uh, as a collective body, when we agree in one voice, Lord, you know, bless this town. When we say that together, it's powerful. So I want us to think about prayer. Prayer is going to be really important. I mentioned the buildings. These buildings are an amazing inheritance for us. You know, just a a minute or two ago, I was recording the songs and the sound of my voice. Maybe maybe you can hear the reverb. I'm not sure. But there's a wonderful sound in this building. I can't get that sound in my front room. And it's not just that. This building is a place where memories are made, isn't it? Place where we meet people. Place where children are baptised. Place where weddings take place. Place where funerals take place. A place where we mark the important moments in our lives. These buildings really, really matter. And what I want to see as we go forward is new people coming here and making memories that are part of their lives too in this building. Here, in the hall, in the cafe. We really need to think about how we can make this building not just a place that's significant for us, but a place that this community owns, that this community feel belongs to them as well. It's a place where God is worshipped and known, but it's also a place where he is shared. 
So that word go is sometimes actually just about opening your doors and meeting people where you meet as well as out there in the streets beyond. Now let's think about how we can really make this building a place which has significance and value and is hugely welcoming to the people around us. Another thing is that we need to know, this might surprise you, how powerful we are. Now, that doesn't sound weird. I'm not, on a, I'm not on a power trip here, and I'm not encouraging any of us to be on a power trip either. But notice what Jesus says. He says, all authority has been given to me. Therefore, go, and I will be with you. Now, if you think about what that means, what that means is that when we go to share the good, to be Christians, to be the people that God has made us in the community, where we meet people at the bus stop, outside the school gates, wherever it is. We're going with Jesus beside us, and Jesus, who's always with us, as he promised, and he has all authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, we walk into the world with all the authority of heaven and earth. How much power do we want? How much significance do we want? That's who we are. Now, you know, all the way through this um, coronavirus thing, um, the prime minister and the, uh, the guys who stand, the women and men who stand on each side of him, the medical experts, have been talking about this R rate. So if one person with coronavirus comes in contact with one other person, that's an R rate of one. Now, I want you to flip the idea into a gospel idea. How many people that you come into contact with can you give the idea of Jesus to? What's your R rate? How many people can you communicate the gospel to? Because, you know, this is going to sound like a weird thing, but I want you to think about it. The gospel is more infectious than coronavirus by a long way, if we let it be. You meet so many people every day. You can communicate. Why People will ask us, why? Why do you gather to worship God? Why does this matter to you? Why do you care? We can talk about the peace that's in our hearts. We can talk about the hope that he gives us for the future. We can talk about the joy that we find uh, when, when we know that the whole world is in his hands. And yes, we worry and yes, things are tough, but I wouldn't be without my journey with God. We can say those simple things that are just ours, unique things to share and to say. What's our R rate? What's the rate at which we communicate the gospel to the world around us? We're very powerful. We're very powerful. And the gospel is actually about changing the world, isn't it? So we can be the change that we want to see in the world. A, a, a bunch of Christians, however small we might feel, however weak we might feel, however hard the situation might feel, a group of Christians who are doing the go and the share in the power of Jesus are very very powerful agents for changing the world. So I really want us to get hold of how powerful and significant we, you, me, are in changing the world for the sake of the kingdom of God. And we need to trust God. We need to trust God for the next stage. You remember what I said, the gospel uh, in summary is Jesus is risen. That was what the people first said. Actually, they didn't say it like that, did they? They went, oh, Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen. Right, okay. So Jesus is risen. Death is defeated. He has proved his worth. He has proved that his word is worth something. The enemy took him right down into the, into the kingdom of death and he went down there and by the power of the Holy Spirit, he defeated death. Okay, that is our Lord and our God. That is who we follow. So what are we going to say about the future? No, it's not going to look the way we want. No, everything isn't going to be the same. Yes, things are going to be tough. But the power that's on our side, the power that is alive in us, in the risen Christ, is more than a match for anything that the future is going to throw at you or throw at me or throw at us as a church. And I'm not saying that glibly. I'm saying it because I believe it with every fibre of my being. I believe it. And I want us to move forward, not triumphalist, not like, a, like a, a march. I want us to move forward confident, confident that our God in us, alive in us and working through us is more than strong enough for any challenge that we face. Jesus says all authority in heaven and on earth. All authority, not just some, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
Therefore, my people, go. Share me with the world. Be open. And know that I am with you always to the very end of time. So, loving Father, loving God, as we come to you in prayer, we say thank you, Lord, that you have promised us that you will walk with us through everything that is to come. You will walk with us into the future, whatever it may hold. And you call us to go, but not to go alone. You call us to go in your strength and in your name and in your power. So, Lord, as we pray together, as we think together about these buildings, as we think together about the significance of our own mission and our own calling, we ask, Lord, that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us compassion, that you would give us confidence, that you would give us joy as we go. We don't want to work these things up as emotions in our own hearts. We, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come and give us these things. Because without them, we are just people, as powerful as that is. But when we are joined with you, and we know that we are, there is nothing that the enemy in the world can throw against us that will prevail. For you are the Lord who raised Christ Jesus from the dead, who has promised us the Holy Spirit, and who will bring all of creation to a wonderful conclusion in his wonderful kingdom the kingdom we're building right here and now and so we thank you lord for this privilege we pray all of these things in jesus name amen
So we come to our time of prayer together now. We're just going to talk to God. And uh, if you'd like to close your eyes, if you'd find that helpful, please do uh, go ahead. And wherever we are right now, uh, we can pray. And the promise of Jesus is that by his Holy Spirit, all of our prayers come into the presence of our Father God. And he hears our prayers and our prayers make such a difference. So I invite you to join me as we pray. At the end of each section, I'm going to say, in our mercy, and then I'm going to say, hear our prayer. And if you'd like to uh, join in, if you'd like that, to make that a way of saying, I, I agree with these prayers, then, then go ahead. In your mercy, we say, hear our prayer. So let's pray. Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come to you in prayer. We come to you confident that you are God of love and faithfulness. And so we come with the burden of the world, of our community, of our town, of our church, and of our lives. And we bring these things to you because we know that you know us through and through, and you love us, you know this world through and through, and love it beyond anything that we could imagine. And so we pray for your whole world, in this time. We remember the United States of America, where there is continuing unrest in many of the cities in that nation and in other parts of the world. And we know that there are many who cry out for justice and there are many who cry out for peace. And we know, Lord, that you are a God of justice and you are a God of peace. So we pray that justice might flow like rivers through the streets of the cities of America, of our own country, or of this world, and that your peace might flow too. And we know, Lord, that you promise peace, not the way the world gives, but in the way that you give it. So that's not just the absence of conflict, but the presence of righteousness and justice. So come, Lord, and pour the oil of your spirit on the streets and cities of our world. And we ask you to pour that same oil of peace and justice on the cities where there is war, conflict, civil war, war between nations, whatever the cause. We ask again that your justice might flow like rivers your peace, which you give not as the world gives, might flow in those places. We pray that your oil of peace and justice might flow where people live in the grinding indignity and injustice and despair of poverty. And we pray that you might keep these things in our minds, Lord. You're a God who cares about justice. You're a God who cares about the poor. You're a God who is the Prince of Peace. And so we need to be a people who are concerned for justice and concerned for the poor and concerned for peace. So show us how we can turn that concern both into positive action and into prayer. Lord God, Lord of creation, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. So we pray for the church, the whole people of God throughout the world. And we remember in a situation where it's easily forgotten that there are many people who say those three words, Jesus is risen, say Jesus is Lord, and it's a great risk to them. It's a great peril to their lives their livelihoods, their families, to say that. It is in the underground church in China. It is in North Korea. It is in many parts of the world. And so we pray for the church, wherever she's persecuted, wherever she faces repression. And we offer the prayer that the church in those places always asks us to pray, which is not so much keep us safe, Funnily enough, it's give us courage. 
and let us see the fruits of our work in new people coming to faith. And so that's what we pray. Give courage and steadfastness to your church throughout the world. Let them see fruit uh, of new people coming to faith for their work for the gospel. And let them know that they are not forgotten by their brothers and sisters uh, in, in faith in parts of the world like this where it is not dangerous to be a Christian. Help us not to be complacent, but to keep them in our prayer. Lord God, Lord of the church, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for this nation, we pray for this town, and we pray for those uh, who are just coming out of lockdown, the shops that are opening, the places uh, of gathering that are opening, and we pray that you would keep this community safe as the lockdown begins to ease. We pray uh, for those shops and businesses which are just right on the teaching on the edge of bankruptcy or perhaps where they've already had to surrender to the inevitable and, and they have had to close. And we pray for those people. We pray for their livelihoods. Uh, we thank you for their service. We ask, Lord, that you would protect the economic life of this town, not so that we can hoard it and become rich, but so that we can share together the good things that you have given us and so that we as a community can thrive together. And we pray that you would protect this town. We pray for that sense of community that we've seen growing on the streets. We pray that that would continue to grow. Neighbour looking out for neighbour, friend looking out for friend. We pray that we wouldn't lose that, but we would keep it at the heart of our community and that you would be the strand that binds us together. Lord God, Lord of our city, our town, in your mercy hear our prayer. Finally, we pray for ourselves. We pray for our homes, for our families, for our loved ones. And in a moment of quiet, you might just like to call to mind someone you know who is in particular need of prayer. It might be for physical sickness, for mental or emotional uh, support, for any kind of need, perhaps loneliness or anxiety. Just name those people before God right now. Lord God, we pray and uh, for all those whom we've named in our hearts, that you might visit them with your peace and your healing and your blessing. We pray for those who mourn the loss of loved ones or whose year's mind of the loss of loved one comes at this time, that you would uh, bless them. Uh, you promise uh, that those who mourn uh, will be comforted and so we pray your comfort for them. And Lord, as we think about the future, we ask that you would give us courage that you would give us confidence in you, that you would give us joy as we go into the world filled with your power and your presence and your purpose. Lord, Lord of our hearts, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So we bring all our prayers together by saying the words that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
willing and I will be one Be thou my breastplate, my sword for the fight Be thou my armor and be thou my shelter and thou my high top raise thou me and would great power of my bound riches I need not nor world's empty prey thou mine through all my days Thou and Thou only the first in my heart High King of Heaven my treasure Thou art High King of Heaven when Battle is done, God heaven's joys to be bright heaven's sun. Christ of my own heart, whatever before, still be my vision. So we're going to finish with a prayer of blessing. Now, a blessing, somebody saying they want to pray a blessing for you, is a gift. And what do we do when we receive a gift? Very often we hold out our hand. So if, if you'd find it helpful when someone prays a prayer of blessing for you, you might like to hold out your hands in that gesture that says, Lord, I want to receive the good things that you have for me. So I'm going to pray this prayer of blessing for you and your homes and all those you love and pray for. Heavenly Father, give us grace to face the challenges and seize the opportunities that are ahead. For we know that you walk beside us with your power and your grace and your strength. And so now may the blessing of God Almighty, God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with us and among us and with all those whom we love now and always. Amen.